I'm afraid I have just muted you all because we're going to make a start. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Zoom service at St Philemon's. Um, and in particular, welcome to you if, if you're not part of our church family, but you're visiting us today. I'm Alice. I'm on the staff at St Philemon's. And, um, and I'd love to hear from everyone what, what we've got up to over lockdown in our free time. Would you raise a hand for me if you've been in touch with someone after a long time of not being in contact? Yeah, me too. And hands up if you've if you've already got around to doing some of the DIY. <laughs> Rod's very nice. Anyone started any other new skills? Well, not many of us. Okay. I've started um attempting to cook slightly more exciting meals. Anyone else been doing that? Yeah. Children, it is lovely to have you with us. Can you give me a wave if you've done any cooking? Yeah, who knows what the results were like. Good on you. It's very nice to have you with us too. The plan is that you children will have fun with us for another quarter of an hour. And then your parents will have a few minutes to get you settled down with something to do or something to watch. And then us adults will continue the service together. On the screen, you can see how we're spending our hour together. We'd recommend you be on gallery view for most of the service. So that, that means we can see each other and then speak of you for the message from the Bible that's gonna happen later. I'm gonna pray for our time together now. Father God, you're God our saviour. And we're together now wanting to know more of your gospel, more of your true good news. This morning, as we sing and pray and listen to your message, please would you prepare us to live out the gospel all week in Jesus name. Amen. Well, the Bible says that we're like sheep, we need a shepherd. And you may feel particularly at the moment like that for yourself or for people you know. But anyone following Jesus has a shepherd in Jesus. We've got a video now of Psalm 23 to encourage us that that's true. My shepherd. He is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He, he makes me lie my down shepherd. in green pastures. He is he my shepherd. He leads me beside my wild shepherd. waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, he is my I will shepherd. fear no evil. With your he is my shepherd. Your rod and your staff. He is they my shepherd. Me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My, my cup overflows. He is my shepherd. Surely your goodness he and love will shepherd. follow me all the days he of my is life, my and I will dwell he in is the house my of the Lord. He is my shepherd. In the Bible, God calls himself our shepherd and he calls himself God our saviour. And that is very good news for people like us who need saving. We're going to confess now to God how we've opposed him and ask him to forgive us. If you want to, join with me in praying. Almighty God, you have revealed your grace for the salvation of all people. That grace teaches us to give up ungodly living and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives as we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus. We confess that we have resisted your grace and opposed your good work in us. For the sake of your only son, forgive us and purify for yourself a people who are your very own eager to do what is good. Amen. Here's a verse from the Bible to anyone who's confessed their sin to God and asked for forgiveness. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Let me pray. 
God our Saviour, thank you so much for your kindness and love and mercy saving us. Amen. We're going to sing together. We'll sing once with the words on the screen and then once with the words in the chat so we can see each other. Is it the next screen, Gabriel? Ah, grand. Um. <laughs> might be thinking do we have what we need to get through what we're facing at the moment and our song we've just sung gives us the answer that the lord god's grace is sufficient that's the love that god gives us even though we don't deserve it it's sufficient for every need we're going to sing that twice more <laughs> be led in prayer now here are a few of the people who will be praying for coming up on the screen here's rod thomas our bishop and these are the east family who we support as a church they've been helping christian students in japan to share the good news about god our savior so we're going to be led in prayer by albert phil kat annalise and their dad <coughs> We pray this morning for all families, our own, our church family, and our friends and neighbours. We ask, Lord, that each of us at this time find a peace and comfort in very trying and difficult times. And we think especially of children and elderly people who are struggling, struggling with loneliness, depression and sadness and so many worries for the future. Lord, you know our frailties and our weaknesses. So we all look to you for comfort and peace and for the love that you show to each of us, as well as the many blessings given that we do not deserve. Keep each of us safe in the coming week in the knowledge that you are looking over us. We ask in your name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for our pastors, Brian and Andrew. We thank you for their willingness to take on the immense responsibility of being shepherds over us under Christ. We pray that they would hold tightly to your word, that they would continue to teach your word faithfully, that you would give them all the wisdom they need for the decisions they make. And, it, and that they would be great role models for us in how to live as Christians, constantly pointing us towards Christ. We pray similarly for our Bishop, Rod Thomas. In particular, we pray that whilst Rod is unable to hold regional meetings and to travel to churches because of the pandemic, we pray that you would still be providing him ways through which he can encourage the churches under his care. Amen. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for Richard and Catherine East. Thank you for their hard work for the gospel among students in Japan. Thank you for the fruit that they've seen. Thank you for students professing faith in Christ and for students who are boldly speaking out for him. We pray for new believers that they might stay faithful to Jesus until he returns and not get pulled away from him by the cares of this world or by the devil. We pray too for the continuing work of the gospel in Japan. Thank you for new Japanese staff workers joining the student ministry recently. And we pray that you would give them everything they need to be doing your work. We also pray for Richard, Catherine and the girls as they prepare to return to England next month. Even in the middle of uncertain times, please help them to keep trusting in you as their rock and their redeemer. Amen. Amen. Father, please give us boldness and strength to speak about your gospel to, our, to others around us, whether that be our neighbors, our friends, our family. Please give us wisdom of what is the best way to share the gospel with them during lockdown. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the peace and security we do enjoy today, for the stability that we so often take for granted. We ask that you give our leaders the wisdom to guard our nation and the world out of the current economy crisis. We pray for the authorities that they will have the wisdom to protect all the information they receive about the virus, courage to make the right decisions and stamina as they work on late. Please give to governing authorities wisdom in their management of this crisis and give to your people your peace beyond understanding. Generate some wise hearts and the renewed trust in your sovereign good, goodness and glory. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 We're going to sing now, led by our music group. If you have children, now's the time if you want to, to get them settled down doing something else so that you can join in with the rest of the service later.
Sarah is now going to read to us from the Bible from Titus chapter 3. Dear God, pray that as we read the word in Titus chapter 3, that you open our ears to listen and open our hearts to hear you as you speak to us through the passage. Amen. He is my shepherd. He refreshes my soul. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient and to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a decisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Sainas, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not, li not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, let me add my welcome to Alice's. It's great to have you with us. I'm far enough to become one of the pastors here if we've not had the opportunity to meet. Look forward to doing so at some point. And I'm so grateful, by the way, to uh, all those who've worked really hard to make what could be quite an impersonal thing, just talking with each other over a computer into something really personal and, and uh, something that involves lots of people from Philly. So thank you. Um, Gabriel, particularly running the technology for these services, runs quite a high wire act every Sunday morning. So please be praying for him. Now, at the heart of Titus is a message God passionately wants people to believe that he is a savior. God takes people who are so broken that we might think they should just be thrown away, either because they're full of themselves and loveless or foolish and corrupted or lazy and addicted, and he redeems them. He gives them a fresh start to begin to live increasingly the life they were put on this planet to live, a life in relationship with him that can start now, wherever they're at, and that continues on and on forever and ever, a life that is in the deepest sense productive. Why does God do this? He does it simply because he's kind, gracious, lavishly generous, utterly trustworthy, infinitely powerful, wonderfully purposeful. 
And do you know that to offer this redemption, God in Jesus had to die. But he did so willingly because of the kind of God he is. That's the message at the heart of this letter. God, our saviour. And for everyone's obvious benefit, God wants that gospel widely believed. Now, how will that happen? According to Titus, it happens through a series of steps. First step, we make sure that people who know this God and are themselves being present tense redeemed by him are the ones running our churches. Second step, those leaders teach about him to everyone in church so that they too are being present tense redeemed by him in every aspect of life. Third step, those believers therefore start to increasingly lead godly lives as a window for the world into what it is to know this saving God. And it's when that happens, one more step, that the world listens. And so this letter is in the Bible, I take it, to encourage churches like ours to see that this chain you can see on the screens is in place and functioning in our church's life. Last week and this week, we're teasing out this little bit of the chain. Um, there's a principle taught at the start of Titus that our knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. It's a magnificent promise, but it invites us to ask at least a couple of questions. First, what will such godliness look like for me? And secondly, what is the truth that leads to it? These are the questions that Titus chapters two and three answer. So first then, what is the godliness? Uh, what will godliness look like for me? Of course, fundamentally, godliness means the same thing for everyone. There's only one God, and so there's only one way to be like him. Uh, it's to be kind, honest, submissive, generous, purposeful, and so on. But as we seek to grow in these ways, there are a couple of things things that Titus says we must pay attention to. Now, excuse me, I'm just going to close my blinds because I think the sunlight is, must be annoying for you as you look at me. Sorry for that. Is that better? I think that's better. Okay, a couple of things we need to pay attention to as we seek to grow in godliness. One of them we looked at last week and it's from chapter two. Do you remember it's to do with our life situation? So last week, uh, Paul addressed five different groups of people in different situations, each with struggles that Paul says they will particularly uh, need to address because of their age and stage. So if we want to grow in godliness, we've got to learn to take our life situation seriously. But the other thing this letter highlights that we have to pay attention to if we want to grow in godliness, and this is where we'll focus this week, is the particular culture that we find ourselves in. And the task before us is to learn to see it, not as a native, but as God sees it. And that's a really uncomfortable process. First, let me teach this point from Titus itself. In chapter two, there was a word that came up four times. In the Greek, it's sophronas, translated in English as self-controlled. Uh, you can see I've highlighted it there, and it also came once in chapter one. So what you might think? until you realize that the word is used just twice more in the whole of the rest of the Bible. Five times in this letter, twice everywhere else. What's going on? Well, the answer is found in Crete itself. We're told about the culture of Crete in chapter one, verse 12. Crete was a culture that was, if we can just go to the next slide, that was unusually slanderous and slippery with the truth. It was a culture that was unusually rebellious and anti-authority, a kind of wild west, and it was a culture that was unusually enslaved to its own desires. People rarely denied themselves. It was, in short, a culture unusually lacking in self-control. 
And Paul's simple point is that if the Christians in Crete want to become more godly, then they need to reckon on the effect that coming from Crete is likely to have had on them. They need to reckon on how it will have distorted what they think is normal and right and doable and beautiful. And of course, this letter is intended to help them. It's what makes sense of the instructions at the start of chapter three. Paul says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, in other words, not evil brutes. Furthermore, to be ready to do whatever is good, in other words, not evil, uh, not lazy gluttons. And furthermore, to slander no ones, in other words, not to be always liars. And the remaining commands, I think, could probably fit in any of the three categories. What is Paul doing in this letter? He is calling Titus to open the eyes of the Christians in Crete to where they live and how it has shaped them. And because it has shaped them, Paul knows that they might very easily just go for a kind of Christianity that accommodates itself to these things in the culture which if you think about it is precisely what the bad teachers in chapter one were peddling. So Paul says to Titus, you've got to teach them this stuff about godliness with all authority. And don't let anyone despise you as you do so. Remind the people to be subject, etc., etc., etc. Because to be godly, they have to learn to see their own culture as God does. And friends, exactly the same is true for us. Let me lay out four statements that I hope make sense to you very briefly. Statement one, we're all creatures of our own culture. The family we grew up in, friends that we have, telly we watch, education we've received, have profoundly shaped us. So profoundly that even though the precise set of attitudes, priorities and habits that they've given us are shared by relatively few people in the world, they seem to us obviously to be right and normal. We are all creatures of our culture. Statement two, whatever that culture is, it's not perfect. By God's grace, there will be much about it that's very good indeed, but every culture has its blind spots. We see them obviously very easily when it comes to other cultures. Uh, we find it easy to say about Aztec child sacrifices, Chinese feet binding, Indian caste systems, South African apartheid, city of London greed, and even the sectarianism of Liverpool 50 years ago, that these things were wrong. It doesn't mean that the people were sort of bad through and through, but these were blind spots for them, we would say at the very least. We surely can't think that ours is the one time and place to have everything perfect, can we? I mean, how arrogant would that be? No, whatever our culture is, it's not perfect. Statement three, if we want to be godly, we've got to see where it is not perfect. To be like God, we've got to see like God does, but that is incredibly difficult to do because these are blind spots. How do we know which bits of all the stuff that is deeply ingrained in us from family, friends, telly, and so on, we need to thank God for, and which bits we need lovingly but critically to say our, our culture has not got right. Well, you see it on the screens. The Bible is what reveals that to a statement for. In particular, it's those bits of the Bible that seem wrong to us, ugly, outdated, narrow, or undoable, that reveal it to us. These sore spots, when God's Spirit puts his finger on them, these sore spots reveal our blind spots because that's where our culture is lacking the imagination to see things as God does. Let me give an example. Imagine a young man living in Liverpool today who is aware of at least two deep desires within him. One is to shout at people and hit them. He's an angry young man. And the other, is to sleep with other men. The Bible shockingly tells him to exercise self-control with both desires. 
Now, he has no problem accepting he shouldn't hit people because everyone today knows that that's wrong. That's a shameful thing to do, isn't it, to go around hitting people. But to say no to his same-sex attraction, that's impossible, he feels. It's wrong to say that to anybody. Okay, now I want you to imagine the same man living in Liverpool, but this time not in 2020, but in 1020 AD. This is the age of the Saxons and Vikings. And here he is with the same two desires, and he reads his Bible. And once again, he is shocked. But this time, it's not the command about not sleeping with men. In his culture, everyone knows that that's a shocking thing to do. That's shameful. No, it's the one about not hitting people. Because in that day and age, hitting is what men do. <laughs> if you don't do it, there's something wrong with you. And it might well get you killed if you refuse to fight for yourself. So that's the command that seems like it's impossible and wrong to him. Now, what's the difference between the two scenarios? Not the man, and nor what fundamentally is right or doable. And notice that everybody agrees that self-control at certain points in our life is totally appropriate, not to say essential. The only difference is the culture. But you see, when you live in it, that culture is everything. Friends, you know that to that man and the desires within him, God really does have some great things to say. He's got something much better to say than just go wherever the wild horses within you drag you. But he's also got something better to say than this desire you've simply got to bury out of shame. I think everyone knows that's not the healthiest thing to do with the desires that are deep within us. Well, God has a better way. But we've got to stick with him long enough, especially over the sore spots that his word puts its finger on. Because the sore spots invariably are the blind spots of our culture. So friends, what is going to keep us listening to God over them and so to become more godly, so as to not be mere mirrors of our culture, but rather a window into God's redemptive grace. Remember the headline, it's our knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So let's go to our second question now. What is this truth that leads to it? In Titus, truth is another word for the gospel, the trustworthy message about God our saviour. And we're given three summaries of it throughout the letter, one in chapter one, one in chapter two, one in chapter three. The first in chapter one describes the gospel as a God-given promise, the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie has given his word on. So here is a promise that we can, if you like, take to the bank and build our lives on, godly lives on. That's the point. So do you see a knowledge of the truth leads to godliness? The second summary in chapter two describes the gospel as, I'm sorry, it should read, a God-given perspective. The big story of two appearings of Christ within which we can re-narrate the smaller stories of the things we struggle with. And we thought last week about how, again, knowing this story well will lead to godliness. Today, we're going to look at the final summary, which is uh, in chapter three. It's the longest one. And actually, it describes the gospel again as a God-given power a God-given um, promise and a God-given perspective. But it also describes the gospel this time as a God-given power. And that's what I want to encourage us with today. Let's see it in terms of a before and after. Verse three is the before. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Notice that Paul includes himself and all Christians in this description. It's why we need saving. Four marks of people who do not know God. One, foolish. 
We don't see things as they really are. Our sense of what is right, good, uh, beautiful, and even funny is warped. Our sense of what is wrong, evil, ugly, and tragic is warped. And it leads us into so much trouble and pain. And it means that we cause so much trouble and pain to other people. Naturally, our, we are, and our culture is, foolish. Secondly, disobedient. We're rebels without a cause. We can't take instruction. Unless we think of an idea ourselves, we generally don't like it. Any authority figure we see, we delight to tear down, most of all God, naturally we are, our culture is, disobedient. Thirdly, deceived. We don't realise this stuff about us. And fourthly, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. In other words, we're powerless, enslaved, powerless. I always remember C.S. Lewis's words on this. When he was just beginning to explore the Christian faith and he first tried to say no to some of the desires within him, quote, for the first time I examined myself with a seriously practical purpose. And there I found what appalled me, a zoo of lusts, a bedlam of ambitions, a nursery of fears, a harem of fondled hatreds. My name was Legion, referencing that story in Mark chapter five of a man totally domin dominated by evil spirits so that he roamed among graves naked, howling and cussing himself. And C.S. Lewis, an already outwardly accomplished and gifted man, said, I was no less dominated by self-destructive impulses within me than that man was uh, within him. I wonder if you're not yet a Christian, if you can relate a little bit to that. And you too have begun to sense that there is good to say yes to and wrong to say no to, but you can't seem to say it. And you wonder what's going on within you. Your culture tells you you're free, but you feel to be powerless. Well, if God is beginning to undeceive you, that is good news. Because the truth is, naturally, we all are. Our culture is powerless. But for those who trust in Jesus, that is the before. Verse four, but when the kindness and love of God our saviour appeared, he saved us. Now don't get put wrong here, we're not talking about being judgmental, we're not talking about being holier than thou or kind of looking down in a superior way on other people because well done us and they're bad. No, 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 he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. But how did he save us? What was the quality of this salvation? What was its power and extent? Well, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Now, here in these verses is something that we easily as Christians lose sight of, that inseparable from the idea that we have been forgiven, and I think we tie that with salvation very naturally, inseparable from the idea that we have been forgiven by the death of Jesus in our place, is the idea that we have been born again. The washing of rebirth and renewal, which is to say that we are now new people, alive to God, born into his family, adopted as heirs, so that like a growing baby, we will now increasingly take on the family likeness, because his spirit lives within us, so that even as outwardly our bodies waste away, inwardly we are being renewed in the image of God, all this by his spirit, the same spirit through whom the universe was created, there's power for you, who has been poured out on us, how much? Been poured out on us generously. Now, do you get the significance of this? 
if we have come to Christ and put our trust in him, we are not the same people. We're not fools anymore. We're not disobedient anymore. We're not deceived anymore. And we're not powerless anymore. Oh, certainly we will feel those ways some of the time and we will act that way some of the time. But it is not fundamentally who we are. For we are now the free children of God in whom his spirit is powerfully at work up to something in all the circumstances of our life up to something in all the pain of our life up to something in all the complexity of our life up to something even with the thoughts and desires that we've wrestled with our whole lives to make sense of he is up to something and walking in the light of this truth there is no buried shame. There is no repressing of who we really are. No, there is the working out of who we really are by God's spirit. And this is what we are saying yes to when we say no to other things. Indeed, our saying no is a mark of his redemptive grace. You see, it's not just that before you couldn't, but now you can. The good news is before you couldn't and you were alone in that. But now God is at work within you. That's why you are beginning to say yes to things the world around you can't even imagine saying yes to. And it's why you're beginning to say no to things the world around you can't even imagine saying no to. Because God is at work within you. And he hasn't finished yet. The truth is that we have a God given promise, a hope to build a life on. And the truth is that we have a God given perspective, a better story within which we can re narrate the things that we struggle with. It's a great help in being godly. But more even than that, the truth is that we have a God-given power, God himself, living within us. Something we wouldn't have if we were not Christians. But now we do have God working within us to make us into who we really are. And so our whole life can become beautiful window into his redemptive grace and the things that we feel most guilty about become part of that picture and the things that we're inclined to feel ashamed about become a part of that picture and the things we struggle with and feel weakness over and are tempted to despair over become part of the picture of sinners being saved by God's redemptive grace powerfully at work within us to make us truly what we have been reborn to become. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Um, time has gone. There'll be an opportunity for a bit of Q&A this afternoon on this series in Titus. I think Alice will say a bit more about that. Uh, but let me lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you that you are God, our saviour. You are a God who takes people who are so broken that others might think we're good for nothing. And you redeem us. You give us a good God-given promise of eternal life. You give us a God-given perspective within which we can see our stories differently. And you give us this God-given power so that we're not powerless 
not helpless, we're not victims, we're not enslaved. Please, Lord, help us to stress these things to one another and help us to believe them, that we might be devoted to the lives that you have saved us for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've got a chance now to continue praying together for about five minutes. God's spoken to us and we can speak back to him together about what we've heard from Titus 3. Um, we're going to be put into breakout groups for that. And if you feel able to pray out loud, then go for it. And if you prefer just to listen to other people praying, then you do that. Welcome back. Welcome back. We're going to sing together about God's amazing grace. That's his undeserved love for us. Great. Almost blind. Three, four. together and families celebrate one another's birthdays so we celebrate there's too many of us to celebrate every birthday but we celebrate the big ones and Stella Clark is coming up to a birthday on Tuesday I won't say how old she is she can let you know if she wants to and Savannah is coming up I think to four years old tomorrow as well so we've got birthday cards for them and they'll go out this week but if you want to get in touch and say happy birthday you can I'm going to tell you about a few things coming up at five o'clock today, Brian's already told us we've got the Q&A. On Facebook and on the church weekly email, you'll find the, the website 
and on that you can post your questions in advance or you can vote up questions that other people have submitted. And next weekend is going to be really very special. Um, every year we go on holiday as a church together in May, our weekend away, and it's such a good time. So, so we're not going to miss it, but we're going to have a weekend at home instead, all on Zoom like we are now. And as, as usual, we're not going to be... Oh, one moment, I'm just going to share a bit more about the weekend at home. Um, it's going to happen next weekend. And um, as usual, we've always done it, that it's not exclusive. It's not just for our church family, but friends are just welcome to join in for any of it they'd like. So we're going to see a video now about what's going to be happening next weekend. Bible about being one with Jesus. It's a life-changingly good thing to be thinking about. This isn't a quiz where you're going to need to know lots of obscure facts. It's going to be an hour of picture rounds and memory rounds and lots of fun. Get your gym kit on and join me for a 40 minute workout. Whatever your ability, you'll be able to get something out of it. I know you have a hidden talent too, and we want to see it. Take a video of your talent and send it in. And on Saturday, we will be showcasing all the amazing things you guys can do. Make your own lunch and join a small group of church family in the Zoom breakout room. We're going to have lots of different games in separate breakout rooms. We're going to have board games. We're going to have games like Uno and code names. We're going to have kids games. And we're also going to have another home workout. See you there. 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 Not you. No dogs allowed. Fantastic. That's all happening next weekend. Our time's almost up. Um, once our service is over, you'll be able to join a breakout group to chat. Um, so join in if you'd like with that or just leave the meeting at that stage if you need to be off. So we're going to pray together before we end. You can pray in the language you're most comfortable in. The words are going to come up on the screen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.